to the Oaks Church. My name's Terry Lee, and uh, I'm one of the drummers here at the Oaks Church. I mean, I'm one of the, I'm also a pastor here at the Oaks Church. No, um, it's actually a, a wonderful thing that I get to play drums today because our normal drummer, Mark, uh, he and Emily welcomed their beautiful baby yesterday morning. So yeah, so we're super excited. Um, they kept the gender a secret, so I don't want to ruin it. You can just text them, or maybe you already know. But, uh, but yeah, so it's an exciting, exciting thing for them. Um, I'm excited as we continue to work through the book of First Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and find the letter of First Corinthians. It's in the New Testament. Uh, so you'll get to Matthew, keep going right, and eventually you will hit this letter called First Corinthians. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's totally fine. It'll be on the screens beside me, and uh, we also have some Bibles in the back that I would love for you to take um, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, because we believe that you getting to hear from God throughout your week is a really important thing, and we would love nothing more than to gift you with a copy of God's Word. Um, I was just reminded as I was praying through this last night, and and just thinking through this morning, uh, for those of you who have been tracking with the series of 1 Corinthians, you know that uh, we're going to get into some pretty controversial stuff this morning. We're going to get into a passage where um, there may be more questions than we have answers, honestly. Uh, But just the fact that we get to come to God's Word this morning and open it up, the fact that I could go to sleep last night knowing that there's nothing that I've read this week Um, that would be different from whenever I opened God's word this morning, that God's word is faithful, that God is unchanging, that there is not a promise in his word that will ever fail. And and so I just, I just want us together as a church to, to worship the Lord this morning, not just by singing, uh, not just by praying together, not, not just by reading scripture, but also as we just submit to his word and say, Lord, we believe that you have something to say for us here this morning, and even though there are going to be a lot of questions, and even though we we admit we can't understand everything, that the knowledge of God is is a depth that is greater than the ocean, and if even we were to search it out, we wouldn't understand it, and so, so we admit, right, that we are creation looking upon the beauty of our creator this morning, and that is reason to worship. Uh, So if you have a copy of God's Word, uh, go ahead and find 1 Corinthians 14. I want to get us up to speed. Um, If you've If you've thought about just kind of this book of 1 Corinthians, it seems like there are so many things that Paul is correcting them about, right? He begins the book correcting them about the way they view leaders. He he begins correcting them about the way they view themselves. And then it's almost like he begins to answer questions. He says, now concerning this, and then he gives uh, some instruction. Now concerning this, and he gives some instruction. Well, if you remember when we were in chapter 12 a couple weeks back, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts. So they obviously wrote to him at some point this letter that we don't have that had a bunch of questions in it. And one of those questions was, hey, what do spiritual gifts mean? Why can some of us uh, just serve really well? Why are some of us so gifted in organizational tasks? Why can some people preach or teach really well? Why can other people, you know, just show hospitality in a way that that is really inviting? Why can some people speak prophecy or even speak uh, an unknown tongue? What does all of this mean? And so Paul just simply writes and says, look, you're, you're a body. And just like a body has different members, a hand and a foot that do different things, none of them is more important than the other. None of them is less important than the other, but they all work together to build one another up. So if you have a spiritual gift, which every believer has, at least one, he says, then you were given that ability, that divine ability to build up the church to the glory of God. So if you just had to summarize, what is a spiritual gift? It's something that was given to you by the Holy Spirit to build up the church for God's glory. Now, he knows, right, that that as people begin to measure their spiritual gifts, and and even as he tells them to seek out spiritual gifts, that people will begin to measure their worth or kind of start flexing on one another because of the gift that they have. And, and, And so he writes this entire chapter admonishing them to love one another. Look, it doesn't matter if you can teach great. It doesn't matter if you can prophesy great or if you're really knowledgeable if the way that you do it isn't loving, you're like a clanging gong or a symbol that never stops. So, so have love, 
Now, now even with that, he knows that, that they're going to have more questions because there are kind of these two gifts, specifically the gift of speaking in tongues that, that they kind of used to measure their spiritual significance. And what we'll see is the problem in the church of Corinth as a result of the culture of Corinth is that they were extremely self-centered. Uh, the culture that they lived in was so self-absorbed. Uh, they came to church not thinking about one another, but thinking, hey, what do I need this morning? How can I be built up? What do I need to get from this gathering? Uh, they, they came walking into the room of the gathering. They were walking into their Bible studies. They were walking into their accountability meetings with one another thinking, what's in it for me? And we could see such a selfish culture and, and perhaps say, how, how is this possible? But if we look at the world we live in, we see that this is the norm, right? Because we live in a fallen, broken world that is marred by sin, we all have this kind of temptation to be drawn in on ourselves, to focus on ourselves, not one another, to focus on ourselves, not our God, right? I mean, if you think about even your life this week, there have been moments that you've thought, well, that person may want to hang out, but what fits my schedule, right? Or, yeah, that would probably be a good cause, but what's in my bank account? Or, yeah, that, that could make that person feel special, but you know what? I, I don't really have time today. I've got this exam coming up, or we've just got a lot of stuff going on as a family, right? We're so tempted to say me first before we think about anybody else. Our culture is this way, and we have to admit that we're often this way too, uh, if you even think about uh, recent studies that have been done, I read um, a little bit of a book this past week uh, just to, to try to think through some of these concepts. A guy named Will Storr uh, wrote a book called Selfie. And he, he, he discovered that in 2014, right, that was like forever ago, that there were 93 billion selfies taken throughout the year. That, that on average, the person who's 18 to 24 years old, every third picture on their camera roll was one of themselves. Uh, we live in a society where it's totally fine to just walk around taking self-portraits and posting them for all to see. We, we want to get likes. We want people to affirm us. We want to spend money on things we don't need to impress people we don't know. And sometimes we can bring that same selfishness into the church. We walk in thinking, well, what, have, what am I going to get out of this? We're often not concerned about the person sitting beside us. That was certainly the case in Corinth. And so what we're going to see today is Paul applying all of those principles from love that we learned last week to the church gathering. So this begs the question, why are you here this morning? Why are we here? Why do we do this every week? Why are you up, right, losing an hour on a Sunday morning to be here, to, to sing songs together, to pray together, to have conversations together, to hear the word of God taught together? What is the purpose of it all? What's well, my prayer that by the end of this sermon, you would be able to answer that question confidently. That as we study the book of 1 Corinthians, you would see that we gather to build one another up, to offer salvation to sinners, and to worship our God. We gather in this room each week for three reasons. To build one another up. Guys, it is, it is no secret, right, that we've been torn down all week long, besetting sins, Lies from Satan have torn us down all week long. Our daily comparison to other people has torn us down. So when you gather in this room, you need your brother and sister to build you up. And that's a part of the purpose of the body. When we gather here, we want to offer salvation to sinners, right? Because we know that our only hope for being reconciled to God is Christ we know that's the only hope for the world around us. And so we want to offer salvation to those who do not know Christ. And finally, as a summary of these two things happening amongst the other things we do in this room is to worship our God. Our weekly gathering is not about us. 
And the sooner we can figure that out, the greater this moment in redemptive history becomes. That every week we're given just a glimpse of what we'll get to do before the throne of God of all eternity. And that is a great and wonderful thing. I want to jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're just going to simply look at three problems that the church in Corinth had. And that's what I think is addressed here by Paul. And these three problems are going to lead him to give three principles for the church. So we're just going to kind of bounce back and forth, right? Looking at a problem in Corinth and then looking at a common principle for our church and what we believe every New Testament church should be about because of the teaching of God's word. So follow along with me in verse 1. Paul says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. All right, the first problem that Paul looks at here in this letter is that when they gathered, they were focused on building themselves up, not one another. Uh, The church got together and they were focused on building up themselves, not one another. Now, Paul begins by telling the church here that they need to pursue love, right? Why does he tell them this? Well, you had like choir members taking each other to court. Uh, that's, that's not a good thing, right? If you look throughout the book, you just see that there's immorality in the church. People are backbiting and, and name calling. There are people who may be in the same Bible study on Wednesday night, but they don't care about each other throughout the week. And, and so what he's saying is you need to pursue love. And they were pursuing love, but unfortunately it was the love of themselves, not the love of other people in the church. Uh, They had turned the church gathering each week into a talent show, right? Because what would be most impressive in their minds? Well, a person who could just kind of get get up and, and have this emotional experience where they're speaking in a language that nobody even knows. And, and it just seems like, wow, that's like a varsity level gift compared to like, you know, whatever you were doing. And so you're just like, man, I wish I had that. And that person's like, well, I do have it, you know. So, so there was kind of this, this like division that was being created in the church. And what Paul is saying is, look, you guys need to pursue love. He points out the problem in verse 4. He says, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. When we gather together, we want to pursue love, not just building up ourselves. Some people would say whenever Paul writes this, he's being sarcastic, saying like, oh, this guy's just building up himself. I I don't think he's necessarily being sarcastic. I think he's just saying that this isn't, helpful, right? I I think there are times that you should build up yourself, um, that you you should grow in the word, and there should be moments where that you're, you are personally benefiting from worship, but your goal shouldn't just be, hey, this is just for me, and whatever happens to anybody else doesn't matter. Um, I I think about uh, Jimmy preparing for his sermon last week, and in the office, you know, he's just like, parsing Greek verbs, and he's like, oh, I wonder if this is like a textual variant, and like, you know, saying this stuff, and like, okay, this is like a fun conversation for us, you know, Um, his mastery of the Greek is very impressive. Now, imagine if he was to get up here and kind of work through all of his Greek study for everybody, right? He would be beaming, right? He he would love it, because that's a gift that he has, and, and that is an awesome thing, but but for most of us, we would be like, well, I, I think this is great. I kind of understand the text better, but I'm not necessarily being built up by that. And so last Sunday, he didn't present that right. He preached the text very well, and we were all built up by it. So, so if, there is, if there is a gift that you have, or if there's a part of your gifting that, that simply uh, 
benefits yourself and does not build up the other church, the rest of the church, Paul says, hey, leave that at home. Uh, the specific gifts that he mentions here it is the one that, of prophecy, because in that time period, it seems like that was encouraging people. That was how people heard the word of God each week. But whenever it came to tongues, he said, unless somebody can understand what you're saying, this is not helpful. And, and so he's, he's telling them, if you just want to look at the principle and, and not get bogged down in, in, is tongue still for today? Um, should we be expecting this? Like, is that going to be the tongues microphone from now on? Like, you know, like what, like what do we do whenever we read this? Um, to, just, to just maybe hold off on that for, for about one more minute, if you can wait. Um, what Paul is saying is, gather here to build one another up, not just build up yourself. That's the overarching principle. Now let's get into the other stuff, right? Prophecy in tongues. Well, I'll admit, um, I'm most likely not going to satisfy anybody with how I address these two issues, okay? Some of you are going to hear me talk about tongues and prophecy and say, wait, he left way too much on the table. Um, he wasn't rigid enough with, with how these things should be practiced in the church. He, he should have put a little bit more restraint on the way we view these two gifts, and then others of you will say, he is stifling the Holy Spirit, right? God wants to do something in this church, and he's just up there, and, and he's, not, he's not letting God do what he wants. Well, God can do whatever he wants, but I also believe that when we come to a passage like this, we have to admit that the secret things belong to the Lord. And, and all week long, I mean, so preparing for this passage, I'm not kidding. We've had several elders meetings about this. Um, we've read books from different sides, people who say that all the gifts are, are still working in the church today, people who say that some ceased with the apostolic age, and so as soon as the apostles died, then, then some of the sign gifts were no more, and, and have prayed through it, and have all of this, and I'm just like, you know what, I don't know, Right? And here's the deal. People get so divided over this issue when Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to unify the church. Isn't that ironic? He wrote a whole book on unity. And what do we do? What's your side? What's my side? Uh, It it pains me to see that. Uh, And and so I'm not going to stand up here and say I've got it all figured out because because I've thought about James 3.1 where it says not many of you should be teachers because you will be judged with a stricter judgment. And I'm like, you know what? It's not worth uh, coming down and saying, I've got this perfectly figured out. Because the last thing that I want to do is stand before Jesus one day and for him to say, hey, do you remember March 10th, 2019, when you tried to sound really smart in front of your church and and you got this all wrong? Let's talk about that, right? I don't want to have that conversation. (laughs) That's just, I I don't desire that, you know? Um, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, like everybody else. And and so, so when we come to this passage, we admit, this is, this is really hard. There's a reason the church has been talking about this for a long time. So we're going to let the Bible speak where the Bible speaks, and we're going to let the Bible define what the Bible defines. So let's understand tongues. Verse 2, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. So let's look at this. Tongue simply means language here. So for one who speaks in a language speaks not to men. Who are they speaking to? They're speaking to God. So this is like a prayer or a praise. It's not to another person. For no one understands him, but he utters mystery in the Spirit. All right, so this is a language that's being spoken. Um, Many people would say this language would be like German or Mandarin or Russian, right? It's a known language in Acts 2. It seems a lot like that's what's taking place. These people who are, are declaring the the majesty of God. They're speaking languages that these people are able to understand. I see that. I also look at 1 Corinthians 13, and I see Paul say, hey, even if I speak in the tongues of angels, right, and, and I don't have love, that would be of no use to you. So then I'm thinking, well, is there another language that angels speak, right? Like when Michael calls Gabriel on the phone, like how do they talk? Is it Hebrew? Is it English? Like, I don't know. So, so maybe there's a language of angels. Maybe it's just other languages. I don't know. But, but it seems that it's not just kind of ecstatic uh, babbling that, that doesn't have any meaning, but there is some kind of code, some kind of uh, verbal transaction that makes sense of it all. From this passage, I do think um, that we'll see that tongues should not be normative in the church. 
and that they are rarely helpful for building up the body, which means that we probably shouldn't do it often, if any. It is always directed to God, and it's always done with complete self-control, right? A fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So if someone is exercising this gift in a way that makes them seem like they are completely losing self-control, then they are contradicting uh, an attribute of the Holy Spirit that they are claiming that is making them uh, exhibit this gift. So uh, just something to think about. In contrast, verse 3 defines what prophecy is. Verse 3, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people, not God, like we just saw with tongues, for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Uh, It seems that the gift of prophecy here is um, not just telling the future, right, as as we see um, many people view prophecy as, but it's it's communicating the word of God and the will of God to a specific person in application for their life. So, So Paul says that prophecy here builds up the church, that encourages, that it consoles, And so if we were to look for a definition of prophecy, I would say that it's whenever someone speaks a revelation from God for the purpose of building someone up. Now, I think that we have scripture as a sure word to speak into someone's life. So perhaps we don't depend on prophecy the same way that they would have. We'll get to that in here in a little bit. But here's a a word of caution, perhaps, to those of you who would say, hey, I've got the gift of prophecy, I think. So I'm just going to try it out. Well, this is what uh, Moses wrote from the Lord to those who were would-be prophets in the days of his writing Deuteronomy. He says, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, talking about the Lord, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. God does not deal lightly with people who put words in his mouth. And we have to recognize the holiness of God. Uh, we have to recognize the gift of his word. And, and we don't want to come to this and be like, uh, you know what, I, I think I know exactly what you need to hear. Base your next 30 days of your life on this word that I have. Right? And, and, and the crazy thing is that like sometimes people, people just throw around the phrase, oh, God told me this. God told me to tell you this, or, or God is telling me this. And man, we need to be very careful with that. Um, I don't want to lead like that as a pastor, right? I spend, um, I spend a great deal of time seeking God's plan for this church, uh, for how to best care for you. But I don't think you will ever hear me say, hey, God told me that we need to buy this building. God told me we need to do this thing. God told me this is our initiative. Because unless there's a chapter and verse beside it, I am very, very, very leery to say anything like that. And I think you should be too. So I I think the context of first century Corinth also helps us understand why these gifts would have been more prominent. Um, The gift of tongues would have been extremely helpful because Corinth was a port city where you had several different nationalities at one time gathering for worship together. And so I could see, uh, since Google Translate didn't exist yet, how it would be very helpful to be able to talk to another person, to be able to declare the glory of God to a person in a language that you had never learned. When it comes to prophecy, why would that have been maybe more common in Corinth in the first century than now? Well, think about it. I mean, whenever we get here on a Sunday morning, what do we say? open to 1 Corinthians. Someone's going to pray. Here's a a scripture that is going to be based upon, uh, or their prayers based upon the scripture they're reading. Whenever we sing songs, you can back it up with scripture. They didn't have the New Testament at that time, right? They were the New Testament. They They were a part of the New Testament being written at that time. Scrolls were extremely expensive. And so if you were going to hear from God, then it was most often going to be because someone had a revelation from God and they spoke it into the lives of the church. We're going to focus a little bit more on that next week as as we get into the later half of chapter 14. But our highest authority is Scripture. Everything we do in the church should be judged and weighed by Scripture. Um, So, you may be wondering, what is our, like, official position on this as a church? Well, we don't really have one, right? Right? 
um, if you have read through our statement of faith, You've seen like, well, there's, there's nothing in here about tongues and prophecy. And, and it's because there are issues as, as Christians that we believe our position is more important than our partnership, right? So whenever it comes to uh, the exclusivity of Christ, right, that you can only have salvation in Christ alone, it is much more important for us to hold that position than it is for us to partner together uh, around something as a church, uh, this is one of those areas where we've said, you know what, the position that we need to take here, we believe uh, people on both sides are, are being faithful to the Bible. It's not a matter of salvation. Um, it's not a matter of, of being orthodox. And so we believe that partnership over this it is perhaps and is better than the position and more important than the position that we would take. Um, so you may not agree with me 100% on this. Uh, you may not agree with the person sitting beside you and how you think these gifts should function in the church. But as long as you say, hey, we're not going to be divisive over the way these things are done, then I think it's a good thing. Here at the Oaks, we believe that the elders have been given to the church uh, to help guide, lead, and shepherd. And, and so I would say if you feel like God has given you a tongue, then, then present that to the shepherds of the church, to the elders of the church, that they may weigh it with Scripture. And if we believe that it's something that needs to be told to the congregation, then we'll do it. Right? If you feel like you have a prophecy uh, of some sort that, that God gave you a word to tell to somebody, um, then bring that to the elders of the church because we're the ones that are in charge of, of shepherding and caring for the flock. And, and we don't want you to just go to someone and say, hey, God told me to sell all your possessions and move to India, right? And then we're like, hey, where's Aaron? And you're like, well, I told him last week that, you know, and it's like, bad move. Wish I would have known about that, you know? So, so the... And Aaron wouldn't do that anyways, because he's extremely smart. And so, um, but if God told him to do that, he would. And so, so here's the deal, right? We just want to be able to care for the flock well. And so we believe that unless you can say, you know, hey, here's a chapter and verse that, uh, that directly says this, um, then we want to be able to care for them well. Um, this is, that took more time than I thought it would go, that would. So anyways, um, Verses 4 and 5, verse 5. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Why are gifts important? To build up the church. Uh, I think the first principle, if we were to just say what applies here to the Oaks Church, it would be that we gather to build one another up. We gather to build one another up. You may be wondering, do people really need to be built up? Absolutely, right? Do you think about where you sit as an opportunity to build someone up? Do you think about the conversations that you'll have around coffee in the back as an opportunity to build one another up? Uh, do you think about the, the person that you may see as you're walking in on a Sunday morning as an opportunity to build one another up? Uh, do you see the conversation that you'll have at child care check-in as an opportunity to build one another up, serving someone communion as an opportunity to build one another up, putting a chair out on a Sunday morning as an opportunity to build a person up. We need to be built up. Your brother or sister in Christ needs to be built up. Consider the week that they've possibly had. There are, there are married couples who have struggled this week to build their marriage around Christ. Encourage them. There are people who have been in the workplace all week uh, where they have been belittled by someone else or feel undervalued. Value them, right? There have been parents this week who, who are wrestling to raise a child in a God-honoring way. Maybe just pat them on the back and say, hey, you're doing a good job. Keep it up, right? We need to be built up because all week long we have been torn down by the judgment of other people or by the way we view ourselves. We are forgetful of the gospel and we need to be reminded of the grace of God. And it isn't it amazing that God uses you as a means of building another person up. When God wants to give a word of encouragement, he uses your vocal cords. When God wants to affirm or encourage a person to bring them comfort, he uses the meal that you prepare. <laughs> 
the, the prayer that you pray over them, when God wants to remind one of his children of his promises, he brings a verse to your mind that you would speak it to them. This is great news that we are built up by others and that we have an opportunity to build one another up. And when you come into this room this morning, you need to admit that you need to be built up too, right? This is the one place perhaps throughout your week that you don't have to feel like you wear a mask, that you don't have to just walk in and grin and bear it, that you can finally break that narrative of just saying good whenever somebody says, hey, how's it going? Right? This is a place where you can be real with who you are, where we can be authentic with one another and vulnerable because we are all in need of God's grace. God has designed the church to be a hospital for sinners, not a beauty pageant for people who have it all together. So when we come into this room, may we be people who say, hey, we're needy and we all need the same thing. We need to be reminded of the grace of God in Christ. And that's what's about to happen every single week that we gather in this room. And so let's be a church that longs to build one another up and realizes how much we need to be built up. John Piper says, there are no meaningless moments in Christian community. Every conversation and every interaction counts for eternity. We are either weakening people's affections for God or strengthening them. So let's strengthen them by building one another up in Christ. Some practical implications for you here. Just don't run out as soon as the service is over, right? Don't race to your car as soon as we wrap up the last song. But try to intentionally have a conversation with someone else. Find someone to grab lunch with. You guys are both already here. Seek opportunities to pray with other people. Build people up with the Bible, right? Maybe you just come in on a Sunday morning saying, you know what, this is a promise of God's word that I'm going to share with somebody this morning. Right? Psalm 90, 14 has been on my mind where the psalmist says, satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love for we will rejoice and be glad all our days. Say, isn't it wonderful that when we gather here, the thing that makes us rejoice and be glad all our days is the steadfast love of God. And that when you wake up tomorrow morning, it will be there the same as it was today and it will never be ripped from your hands. Man, say that to somebody whenever you're just saying, hey, how's your week been? I, I feel like I wanna encourage you in a moment. Right? If we were that kind of church, what would happen in this room? What would happen in our city? The first problem is that the church built up themselves. The second problem in Corinth was that they focused on their gifts and not the giver of those gifts. I want to be brief with the second problem here. Verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Then he's going to use a couple analogies here. If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? So if somebody just gets up here and just starts hammering on the keys or the drums or the guitar, like nobody can sing along, that would be unhelpful. Verse 8, if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle, right? Who will know in the military if they should charge or retreat if the bugle player just gets up there and does like a solo? They'd be totally confused. And Paul's making this argument here. Verse 9, so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. When he says there that, hey, if we're both speaking different languages, you'll be a foreigner to me, and I'll be a foreigner to you. The word that he uses there is barbarian, which the root just comes from it sounding like people are saying like bar, 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 like, like just babbling. And he's saying if people are doing that, and that's what it sounds like when someone's just speaking in tongues, they're not going to be built up by it. It's just going to be speaking into the air. So verse 13, he says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. So if you speak in a tongue, you also need to pray that you can interpret it. Um, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful because you don't know what you're saying. Verse 15, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Both should be engaged. 
Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? What's the purpose there? To say amen to God by what happens in the church. Verse 17, for you may be giving thanks to God well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Wait, Paul speaks in tongues more than everybody? Yes. Nevertheless, in the church... I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What is his purpose? He says everything we do in the church, someone needs to be able to say amen, right? The Lord is good. But what was happening in the church is people were just looking at the people who were exhibiting these gifts that they didn't understand. Everything that happens in the church needs to be done so that someone is instructed and built up in the knowledge of God. And they were living in such a way that nobody was being built up. Nobody was being instructed. The third problem in Corinth, I told you I'd be fast, is their worship led to confusion of unbelievers. So the second principle there is that we gather to worship God. The third problem in Corinth was that their worship led to confusion of unbelievers. Look in verse 20. He says, brothers, do not be children in your think- thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign, not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if you all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. The the third problem here is that people were confused, right? Right? They heard this language being spoken that that they had never heard before or that they didn't understand, and they had no idea what was going on. I read this, and I was reminded of uh, whenever Abby and I taught English as a second language in Louisville. Uh, So all the time, right, we were hanging out with people who didn't speak the same language as us, and we had some friends who who are Arabic, and we would go over to their house oftentimes on Wednesday night for dinner after class. And uh, we're sitting there, and they're like, hey, do you want to watch a movie? And so we're like, yeah, sure. So somehow they pull up uh, this version of Iron Man 2 that they found on YouTube, and it was, the movie was in Chinese and had Arabic subtitles, and we had never seen it before, so we're like, what is going on here? And then they're trying to explain it to us in broken English, and I'm just like, I have never been so confused in my life, right? I walked out having absolutely no idea what Iron Man 2 is about. Whenever I actually saw the movie, I was like, this makes so much sense now, right? The same thing happens in the church if, if what's going on is completely confusing to someone who's never been here before. Paul says that, that people were walking in and, and they were hearing people, you know, speak in tongues and have these emotional experiences. And they walked out and they had no idea. They said, this is not for me. Paul says that they were immature instead of mature for thinking this way, which is ironic because they judged this as a mark of their maturity. Verse 21, he says, in the law it is written, he's talking about Isaiah, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. He's quoting this passage that Isaiah spoke to the Israelites, saying, hey, there will be one day coming where you will hear people speak a language that you don't understand. And on that day, it will be God's sign of judgment for you. What did that mean? Well, people were in their sin, right? They, they weren't worried about who God was or how to worship him. And so God said, hey, I'm going to bring destruction on Israel one day. And one day, whenever you hear a language you don't understand, you'll know that that's my judgment upon you. So whenever Assyria came in and destroyed Israel and took captives and they heard a language that they didn't understand, they understood that God was judging them. 
Now, Paul says in the same way, if, if an unbeliever hears uh, something they don't understand in, in church and they just walk out and say, that's not for me, then it's a sign of judgment on them because instead of the church bringing them closer to Christ, we just push them further away into the judgment of God. Well, that means that everything that we do here it needs to lead someone closer to Jesus, not into being more confused. The, the third principle here for our church and the church today is that our worship should lead to conversion, not confusion. If you're here this morning and, and you're not a believer, I'll just be honest. We want you to become a Christian. We would love nothing more than to see you submit your life to Christ because we believe that the Bible is true when it says that any person who has not received Christ, any person who is not following Jesus is following a path that leads to hell, and we don't want that for you, right? I've got to be real honest whenever I say this. I'm not trying to scare you, right? I'm not trying to, to say, hey, we have everything figured out, and, and you need to jump on our bandwagon. What I'm saying is that Jesus offers life. He offers life abundantly, and if you don't have that, you can have that today, if you'd say, hey, I need, I need more time, right, to, to figure out perhaps how I believe in, in this, I would say, well, we'll walk with you. We're not going to give up on you. We're going to keep on pursuing you with the grace of God. But at the same time, right, this is a matter of urgency. Don't wait, right, because, because I long for you to know the Lord. For those of us who call the Oaks Church home, there's an implication for here, here for us as well, right? When Paul writes, he's assuming that there are going to be a lot of unbelievers in the worship gathering of the church. If he's telling them how to act when unbelievers are there, then that means we need to be bringing unbelievers to church, right? Is there anything that we do perhaps that, that makes this an uncomfortable place for someone who didn't grow up in church, for someone who doesn't know the lingo, or, or for someone who perhaps isn't familiar with what we're familiar with, right? This is why every single thing we do matters, this is why we say that every member is a missionary because God has, has gifted you to be a missionary to this city. Ask the question, who is close to you but far from God and how do you bridge that gap? Who are you praying for right now that you hope is sitting beside you on Easter Sunday? Right? Who are you thinking, I want this person to know Christ and I'll do whatever it takes that they may get a little closer to Jesus? We want to be a church that seeks people out with the love of Christ. We meet people where they are, but love them far too much to let them stay there. Because we know that God is a good and gracious God, and he deserves their worship, and that they can know him through us. I hope you've been encouraged by, by seeing what this gathering means that every single week, God gives us a moment of redemptive history to share for his glorious purposes. And that when we gather here, it's not for self-help, it's for building up other people. It's not simply to be reminded of the salvation we've received, but to also offer it to other. And in doing all this, that we worship our God. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, I want you to be built up by this church but you cannot be built up by this church until you have laid the foundation of placing your faith in Christ. And maybe you have a million questions, but I would submit to you this morning that there would be nothing better for your life than to lay your sin down and say, I want to follow Jesus this morning. Maybe you'd consider yourself disconnected from the church or just been waiting to jump in. From this text, I would say that being a part of a church is one of the greatest ways to see God at work in your life and to jump into his full use of you for his glory. Perhaps you've lost focus of the God that we gather to worship and maybe in communion this morning, you just need to reorient your heart and say, I've, I've become so focused on using my gifts in the church that I've forgotten why we actually gather on a weekly basis. The gospel declares that we don't just need a little self-help, but we need a savior. And when that Savior comes to us in Christ, when we were far from God, Jesus sought us out and lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death that we should have died, rose again that if we believe in him, we would have life abundantly. And this changes everything that this church does. There's a church called Emmanuel in Nashville. And every week, 
they say this at the beginning of their worship gathering. And I want you to hear these words this morning and be reminded that it's true here as well. To all who are weary, rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God's care, God cares. To all who fail and desire strength. To all who sin and need a Savior. To all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And to whoever else will come. This church open wide, opens wide the doors and welcomes you in the name of Christ Jesus. And it is only Christ who can make us whole. He can and he will. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that uh, we get to hear from you this morning. Lord, I pray that in a difficult text like this, that, that you would just hide me behind the cross, Christ, that you would be made much of. Jesus, that, that the words you want us to hear, we would hear and apply. Lord, I pray for those here this morning who, who don't know you, who would maybe feel so far from you right now. God, that in your kindness and your mercy, that you would seek them out, that you would speak a word to them now, and that you would invite them into your loving arms, that you would help them to see that, Jesus, what you did on the cross wasn't just for someone else, but was for them, and that they can have life in your name, and that they would follow you starting today. Lord, for those of us who have been walking with you for a long time, help us to, to be encouraged by a passage like this and, and to realize why we gather every week, that it's not about us, but it's about you and the people that you've placed alongside us. Lord, may we make these moments matter because they do matter and help us to respond rightly as we prepare our hearts to respond to your word. In Christ's name, amen.